Prayer of thanksgiving For blessings we've known through the years To join hands and thank the Creator Now when thanksgiving is due This is Rumble with Michael Moore, and I am Michael Moore. Welcome, everyone. And let me just begin by thanking all of you over the last few days for your response to my Substack column that was posted on Monday morning, Eastern Time in the U.S. It's a, uh, if you haven't read it yet, I encourage you to read it. It's gotten quite a, quite a response. It's entitled, A Memorial to the Terrorists, When the Terrorists Are Us. And it's based on the announcement here over the last couple of weeks that Democrats and Republicans have come together in wanting to build on our National Mall in Washington, D.C., next to the Vietnam Memorial. They want to build a memorial called the Memorial to the War on Global Terrorism. And, man, there were so many awful things about that thought. And the ironies involved, I wrote a piece on it, and I'd love for you to read it on my uh, Substack. Now, if, you, if you're not on my Substack, it's free. You just type in, just go to michaelmoore.com. That's it, michaelmoore.com. And up will pop my Substack site uh, with all of my uh, weekly letters, columns, etc. And uh, it's all free of charge, and you just go there. It may ask you if you want to become a paid member, which you're welcome to do to support our work, but uh, not necessary uh, because none of my writings and none of these podcasts exist behind a paywall. Not at all. But I'd love for you to read these things. They usually come out like on Sunday or Monday, sometimes Saturday, my Substack uh, column, michaelmore.com. So thank you, though, for those who commented and wrote to me about this. It was really very powerful, very powerful stuff. And we also have up our, our more store uh, with ball caps and hoodies and T-shirts and coffee mugs and stuff like that. And uh, uh, you're welcome to visit that and pick up something or uh, get a holiday gift for people in your life, whatever. That's store.michaelmore.com. And with the holidays coming up, the U.S. Postal Service, we, we ship uh, first class uh, delivery. They've told us that uh, you you got to get your orders uh, in if you want a guaranteed delivery by Christmas. Uh, uh, get it in by December 11th. I would even go sooner than that, frankly. And I asked you last week here on Rumble, because uh, I, I get this every year, people, what do, what do I, we're having Thanksgiving again, our crazy brother-in-law is coming, our crazy uncle is coming, our, our, our sadly crazy grandfather. What do we do, Mike? I get this, I mean... So I wrote in, uh, in my book, uh, Dude, Where's My Country? I believe it was chapter 10, uh, a chapter called How to Talk to Your Conservative Brother-in-Law. And uh, this was, when did I write this? Back in the early 2000s. This is like pre-Trump. It was already a problem. You know, once Bush was elected, it was kind of like, that's where these Thanksgiving dinners started falling apart. And so I wrote about this then. And each year I've talked about it, I've, I've posted about it. And this year I thought, why don't I ask you, my Rumble listeners, the rumblers out there, send me what is the biggest problem or how to handle, tell me the one thing that this sad uh, Trumpster person that's going to be sitting at your table, you know, how to, how to deal with it. And so you did. You wrote me this week so many interesting, fascinating, horrifying instances of how you've had to deal with a conservative brother-in-law at the table. And so I said, if you wrote me these, I will give you my advice on today's Rumble, and that is what we're going to do today. Thanksgiving advice for the Trumpster conservative brother-in-law or uncle at the Thanksgiving table. And we're going to do that right after I give thanks myself to our two underwriters for today's show, people to help us uh, uh, pay for all this and get this message out there to people. Much, much appreciation. First of all, uh, a big shout out to Amazon Studios, This is the filmmaking end of Amazon, and they have this excellent documentary division on Prime. Well, they have got a great documentary. they got actually a number of great documentaries this year that I think are probably all going to be up for Oscar nominations. One of them is this beautiful, uh, intelligent, powerful film about the actor Val Kilmer. And uh, you remember Val Kilmer, right, from Top Gun. He played Jim Morrison in the Oliver Stone movie, The Doors. Of course, he, and he was in Tombstone. Remember Heat with De Niro and Pacino together for the first time? Uh, Val was in that, uh, Batman Forever. 
and and then and then he fell ill, and uh, essentially um, lost his voice. Well, he has filmed himself in Hollywood just with his own home video camera uh, for like I don't know thirty, forty years. He has all this tape. So there's this incredible documentary that's out right now, and it's called Val. It's a new documentary, but it's based on all these these home videos, these private recordings that Val has done over the past 40 years during his rise in the film industry. So these two filmmakers who are actually you know, sort of well-known documentary editors, uh, Leo Scott and uh, Ting Pu, uh, I don't know if they approached him or they, he approached them or whatever, but they, they decided to construct a documentary from just the footage of all the, these years of his in Hollywood. And it's, it's revealing, it's heartwarming, it's humorous. It's a portrait of an artist, really. And because of his throat cancer, he has difficulty talking. So uh, a lot of the narration in this is provided by his son, Jack. And uh, there's also some wonderful scenes uh, in the film with his daughter, Mercedes. It was really something to watch. So do yourself a favor, my friends. Watch Val on Prime right now over the holiday weekend. It's a, a wonderful film actually to watch with the family. And I've got a link to the film right here on the description page of this episode. Um, and again, I want to thank Amazon Studios for supporting this podcast, for supporting my voice, and supporting this outstanding nonfiction film and other films like it, but this one in particular, Val. And, of course, I want to thank our very first and our longtime underwriter, Anchor. Is Thanksgiving here, and uh, as I promised you last week, I would on this episode give you my advice for how to deal with family members that seem to have maybe lost their marbles. Uh, they uh, are still Trumpsters. They uh, are not getting vaccinated. There, a whole host of things here, and usually, oftentimes now at Thanksgiving, it ends up in some kind of bruja, some argument at the table over politics and some people just want to eat the turkey so you have written me what to do when uncle herb or grandpa ned or brother-in-law bob start to they know they have an audience that's captive and they're going to tell you about everything uh, from joe biden's uh, socialism to the wonders of bitcoin so (laughs) what i'm going for here is peace on earth and peace at thanksgiving Maybe the first thing I want to say is to the people out there who are alone, um, who aren't having Thanksgiving with anybody this year, either because maybe someone that you love dearly has passed away. Maybe it's because uh, you're far away from your family. Maybe it's because during this pandemic you've realized who your friends are and who aren't. And it's a lot smaller number than you thought in terms of the friends category. All of that has Perhaps for some of you made this to be a difficult and alone Thanksgiving. Some of you are not well. Some of you are still suffering from the after effects of COVID. Uh, Others of you are disabled. Many of you don't have the money to celebrate Thanksgiving and buy the things you're supposed to get and make. And and, uh, you don't have people coming over anyway, so, you know, there you go. And some of you don't want to go to somebody else's house. It's still too scary right now. It's too... uh, Places like, you know, Michigan, it's uh, it's code red. So, um, for a whole host of reasons, I may be talking to some of you who aren't going to... And I think all of us who are grateful, maybe, to be spending time with somebody, if that's possible, on Thanksgiving, uh, to be understanding and considerate of those who don't have anybody and uh, have nowhere to go. And I guess I, to those of you who are in that situation, I, I want you to know that you are loved. And even though I don't know you personally, you share this planet with me. 
uh, you share humanity with me, and that's enough right there for me to express my love for you and, and my care for you and my hope uh, that I want to share uh, with you that uh, we will make things better. We will, we will round the bend here at some point. I do believe that, and I, I believe that we will uh, come out of this okay. So let me just, I just want to begin by, by saying that. And, and then secondly, I, before we go to your letters, let me just deal with a whole batch of letters that are pretty much all the same, which is, um, it seems hopeless to be able to convince certain family members or friends to see the light. And I think probably a lot of people have given up. Of course, the first thing I want to say to you is, this is like, we've already had six Thanksgiving since Trump announced he was running for president back in 15. So you, you had, you've had many of these people over for Thanksgiving for about six years in a row now. I guess maybe my first question is, why? Why are you putting yourself through this kind of misery? And I know the answer. They're family. You have to love them. You know, but we don't choose our family. We don't get a, you know, our, our family, we were born and we're born into a family and, and it's, it's uh, hopefully it's good, but, you know, sometimes it's not good and we didn't get to have a say in that. So we make the best of it. And I know that's what a lot of you have tried to do over these last few Thanksgivings. Should we invite the numbskulls? Yes, we have to dev- invite the numbskulls. They're, they're our family. We love them, uh, et cetera. Uh, so anyways, I get it. Family is why they're still coming, but you have written to me in, once again, sheer dread for what this day is going to look like. And you've given up on trying to convince them of anything, and I can understand that. But I I want to point something out to you. If you feel that they can't change, that they're so far gone, let me remind you that they weren't always this way, especially those that you grew up with or whatever— and you remembered them as liberals or Democrats or whatever. And, and then they made this weird switch. And all of a sudden, they're watching Fox News and they're voting for Trump. You know, let me, let me tell you something. Trump and Tucker Carlson uh, and uh, Alex Jones <laughs> did not win your friends and family over by shaming them, uh, by belittling them. They were, they were won over by this visceral connection that these right-wingers established with them. They figured out how to reach them and touch them. And my point I want to make to you before I offer my advice here is that if they were turned once, turned toward Fox News and Trump and all this, what that means is is that they can be turned again. They were able to make a grand switch. They can make a grand switch again. And you can be part of that, not by shaming them, not by arguing with them, not by telling them that they're idiots, but by finding a way to hold your hand out to them. They will not change at the dinner table. Do not expect that. But there will come a point in time where they realize that they've been lied to, that the, the orange one with his long red tie, it will finally get into their heads, wait a minute. He's fully vaccinated. Well, what am I listening to here? They'll realize the con, some of them, at some point. And I want them in that moment where they're thinking of making the switch again, the switch, the turn to the light. I want them to remember your kind and loving face at Thanksgiving, your hand held out to them, even though you were in vehement disagreement with each other on these things. Now, you cannot have false hope on this. Most of them will not change. But some will. Some will. And you could be a part of that. You can, and you can argue and you can have the debate. It's all fine. It's good. It's American. But you can also use your sense of humor or your sardonic sense of things. You can say things while you're laughing and smiling that, that may make some sense to them. So it's just as an overall thing here that I encourage you to not get all wound up. First of all, you don't need to. You know why? There's more of us than there are of them. They can have all the cranberry sauce they want at the table. There will never be, again, in our lifetime, 
more of them than us. That's over. That's why they have to rig the vote. That's why, that's why they've got to have, uh, when I say rig, I mean, I'm talking about gerrymandering. I'm talking about voter suppression, making it hard for people to vote. They have to do these things because they no longer have the majority of the American people. All right. So I have asked our executive producer, Basil Hamden, uh, to join us because uh, he's got the mailbag. Great letters. And we also have some voicemails that some of you left. So we're, uh, Basil's going to read the letters and we'll play a couple of the voicemails. But uh, uh, Basil, are you, are you there with your bag of, of mail? I, I am here with the bag of mail. Did you want to add anything to what I started with and, and what, how we should uh, deal with people in general at Thanksgiving dinner? I think in general, uh, and, and I've been in some of these you know, Thanksgiving uh, brouhaha's uh, as well, I think it is always best to be, particularly knowing that not everyone at the table cares for politics or wants to be part of this conversation, be as agreeable and good and nice as possible, particularly for the kids who are at the table or, or at the kids' table right, you know, right, right next to you. Ultimately, the best way to win people over is, is if they think that you're, you've got your head on straight, you're nice – then whatever you know, tax policy debate you're having, or whatever inside baseball po- political hot button issue of the moment you're having, may be less important to winning them over and having them grow up to be on your side than the fact that oh, he was the loving one, he was the caring one, he right. was the one yes. who yes. wanted good things for everyone and not just himself or his faction. Right. Think about, think about what Basil's saying here, because I, I do believe that how we behave at the table, the kids down at the other end of the table, the young kids, but also the tweens and teens, and they need to see that we're the, we're the sane ones at the table, that we're not all half cock crazy on this or that or whatever, and we're not hating on anybody. I think just if just setting that tone is one of the best ways to win over, not not crazy Uncle Ned, but the other people at the table, maybe or maybe they're not very political as adults or they haven't made up their minds, or but especially the young people need to say, I'm not going to grow up like Uncle Ned. You know, this <laughs> <laughs> and, and you will have done a service to mankind and womankind if you um uh if you if the young people if that's their takeaway from this uh, Thanksgiving brouhaha. I think that yes, I think that's very very good to point that out. Yeah. Um, all right. So uh, so who do we have up here? Who's our first uh, letter from? First one is from Sarah. Uh, Sarah says, uh, "Hey Mike, crazy relative topic for Thanksgiving. BLM. They claim her family members claim it's a terrorist organization because they saw looting for hours on Fox and Newsmax, and they say that police kill more white people than black people." Actually, very few black people get killed by the police. Thanks, Mike. Right. Yes, I've heard. I have heard this one. Well, I would say to you, uh, first of all, one way to get them off the topic is just confuse them with these acronyms. There's so many letters of the alphabet being thrown around. around when they when they say that BLM is a, a terrorist organization, uh, you can quickly come back with saying, uh, you know, uh, Aunt Aunt Mabel, I, I think you've got uh, I think you've got BLM uh, confused with LGBTQ. And they won't be able to get through half those letters, but they will hear the B and the L in the LBGTQ. And um, see, th- just say, those are the terrorists. Now, of course, the danger of that is you don't want them thinking gay people are, are terrorists. But uh, sometimes I found just to, just to help confuse the issue by throwing out more acronyms is always a, a good way uh, uh, to, to win the argument. The larger issue that she's raising, though, is... Um, uh, what, was she, what did she say at the beginning there? The um, BLM is a terrorist organization because of she sees looting hours right, the, looting yes. on TV. Okay, so so how hmm, how do we deal with this? Uh, uh, because obviously, oh my God, we're all so fortunate to have Black Lives Matter uh, at the forefront of of these last uh, couple of years. Uh, but when they go when they go to Fox News, but if you say it's like almost a a thing with them, like they've got a button there on Fox News. If you say BLM, all of a sudden uh, somebody hits a button and cities are burning. It's, 
it's like the fear the fear of a what was the what was the public enemy album uh, fear of a black planet yes uh yeah. yeah so that's that's right there in their heads I mean, what do you i mean uh, how, how would you deal with that well i, I whenever blm comes up i mean it, it's just the best we're talking amongst white people now by the way this is right, not a right kind of if they're african americans black people in, in the ta- at the table there may not come up at all but so yeah so just, i think we just, I just want to make clear this is a a white or non-black i should say conversation exactly exactly it's not white people it's it's non-black people n- right. any non-black groups um including you know tables like like my uh you know arab uh, thanksgiving uh table the best thing to do is step back and I think the best way to win people over and, and at least get some agreement on your side is explain to people why we say Black Lives Matter. Mm. If we can just step back and explain why we say it. I mean, just from the get-go, they took BLM and turned it into, no, but all lives matter. Even Martin Luther King said that all uh, yeah, everyone <laughs> should be the same and blah, blah, right. blah. Just we need to step back, and if you're dealing with a someone who who hates the concept of BLM and is very against it, um, just ask them like, should a black person's life matter as much as mine or as much as yours? And I think they'll feel compelled to say yes. I mean, okay. yeah. If you say to, if you say to the uncle, does a black life matter as much as yours, boy? He will lose the rest of the room if he says, yeah, my life matters more than their life. No, he's going to say, yes, of course, a black life matters as much as mine. And then you just say to them, right? I mean, if I get what you're saying here, that's, that's all we're really saying here then. Black lives matter. Just admit that black lives matter. Uh, and it doesn't mean that white lives don't matter because that's kind of a given, isn't it, in white society? Yeah, we're, we're saying black lives matter because – that currently is not the reality. Currently, black lives are treated as disposable, less than. So, yes, we want all lives to matter. Therefore, that's why we're promoting the concept that black lives do matter, because they are currently treated as disposable and less than by, certainly by police departments, but by all facets of our society. But if you can just get them, if you can just reach across the aisle and get them to get them to reach across and say, acknowledge that, yes, a black person's life should be valued as much as mine. That will be a good little victory right there to set the tone. I like little victories, especially with them, because I think there are things you can get most of them. Now, not some of them, but most of them to agree. Like I've always found... uh, Okay, so you say you're a conservative and all that, and you for Trump and all that. But let me can I do, let's get away from the the politics of this. Just let me ask you some basic philosophical questions. Do you believe a woman should be paid the same as a man if she's doing the same job? Very few people are gonna even if they want to say no. Yeah, women should be paid less. They're not gonna say that out loud if they wanna if they wanna win the table, right? I mean, right? Most conservatives are going, yeah, of course, uh, women. They're doing the same job. <laughs> Should be paid the same. You know, and you can start going down a little. You want to drink clean water, right? And breathe clean air? Yes, I do. Of course, of course. Well, then you care about the environment. You are, on, in, in your own way, an environmentalist because you will not let that drinking water that we're drinking here in our town be poisoned, right? Or breathe that, breathe that air? That's right. You know, so does it, does it have to be poisoned? For you to actually fight to make that clean, that water and that air, does that have to be poisoned by the Chinese? Is that, is that how your mind shapes this thing? Or is it just you don't care who it is, including if it's the local company that employs the most people in town, that you're not going to drink poisoned water? If you can't win them over on clean water, then, then you may as well shift the topic to... Uh, <laughs> to the Detroit Lions. Hey, isn't the Lions game on? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Well, that's a losing discussion for everyone, except the Lions right. opponent, of course. But other other than the few in Michigan who still 
are in support of the Lions. Most of us have switched to, to Green Bay, but now we've got a problem with Aaron Rodgers. So oh, yeah. I don't know where we go. Do we? Have, do you have a team we can we can get behind? Seattle, maybe. I don't know. Well, they're they're struggling. I mean, my Giants and Jets are are, are struggling. So, um, but you see, look how we just did it. We're off onto football now. All right, what's our next here? Jordan. He says, "Hey, Mike, I'm expecting certain family members to say that Kyle Rittenhouse was justified in his actions because there were windows to protect, and he was in fear for his life." So, uh, Rittenhouse, Rittenhouse is going to come up at, at at a lot of Thanksgiving yeah, tables. That's a- that feels like a tough one, but it shouldn't be because um, what I would say right away is, oh, okay, so you hate the police. And, and, and Uncle Bob will go, well, what do you mean I hate the police? I don't hate the police. No, you are hating on the police. If you're saying that you want 17-year-olds with AR-15s to just be showing up from out of state to protect our town, that the police in our town aren't, aren't good enough, that's what you just said. You you think Kyle Rittenhouse did the right thing and, and the people – of Kenosha did the right thing by letting him off uh, because that we want, we want teenagers from towns and other States bringing their assault weapons to our town and patrolling the streets. What's uncle Bob going to say to that? But you set the terms of the debate by saying, so let me just get this straight. You think that's a good thing? Yeah. 17 year old coming from another state patrolling yeah. our streets in our town with an AR 15 because why the police here suck. You hate the police. You want to defund the police? Why, why do you want the Kyle Rittenhouses to come to our town with their assault weapons? It, it, you could do this. If, if you've got a, a 16, 17, 18-year-old at the table that everyone in the family knows not to trust with, you know, ordering a, <laughs> ordering a cup of coffee, let alone an AR-15, yeah. then, then hey, imagine, you know, uh, Stevie over there, uh, you know, walking into this room now with an AR-15 and his hat backward and a, and a grin on his face. Like, oh, what, that if, what like- if he walked in here right now with an AR-15? <laughs> Our cousin. Yeah. yeah. Little Stevie. Yeah. Th- there's a common sense argument to be made here about just on a common sense level. Will our streets and our neighborhoods and our lives be safer with more Kyle Rittenhouses patrolling the streets in AR-15s? Or will there be more casualties, more death, and more destruction. I think common sense will let people know that we want fewer Kyle Rittenhouses than than more. You know, I, I have a theory. Um, you know, how he couldn't buy the gun because he was 17. So he got somebody, I guess, who was 18 that bought the gun for him. And, I mean, right away, we know, because we, we made Bowling for Columbine, and we, we, we've studied this issue quite a bit, when a, when a teenager who is a minor can't get a gun and they get a, a slightly older person to get them the gun, we know what's coming next, don't we, my friends? I mean, that, that gun is going to be used in that high school. That's, and, and especially if it's an assault weapon like that. They're not going deer hunting. And so I have this theory, frankly, that the gun was bought for those purposes because remember, when they bought the gun, they didn't know there was going to be a big riot in, in Kenosha. So all of a sudden, the riot is happening in Kenosha. He sees this, and and this is just a theory now. This is a theory. But if he was if he was planning to do uh, a, a school shooting, uh, this kept him from doing it. He said, no, 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 I'm, I'm going to take this gun and go to Kenosha. I'll take care of business there. And, and sadly, uh, two people died. But man, what if that pre- what if the Kenosha riot prevented Kyle Rittenhouse from going and shooting up his school, which could have been the original plan? Why was he in need of an assault weapon when there was no rioting going on in, in Kenosha? I'm just saying. I'm not you know I'm not saying that that was uh, his thinking. And I, I saw him on uh, on Tucker Carlson there the other night, and uh, you know he looked pretty sharp. Let me just say, Kyle. Kyle was not a, a mouth breather the way he looked in court. Uh, and and he, even ex- he even said that he is a supporter of Black Lives Matter. Well, that could be our, our, our big talking point right there when, when BLM comes up. Right. In other words, oh, so you don't like BLM? Well, Kyle Rittenhouse does, <laughs> Grandpa. What do you think of that? <laughs> so now you're, you just said you were in favor of Carl, uh, Kyle Rittenhouse. Now you're against Kyle Rittenhouse. 
Which one is it, Grandpa? Yeah, which one is it? Because we're not going to eat the pumpkin pie. No, it would be mincemeat. We're not going to eat the mincemeat pie until you straighten this out because we're we've confused the tweens down at the the future gun owners of America at the other end of the table here. Kyle Rittenhouse is for BLM. What 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 a what a what a world. <sighs> well, you know, it's why occasionally you have to turn on Fox uh, just for the trippy factor of it. Like, am I on drugs? No, I'm not. Oh, that just happened? He just said that. Uh, or the comedy. There's just pure comedy constantly on Fox. Um, you can't make a parody of it uh, because it's a parody of itself. But Okay, what's our, who's our next letter from? Uh, it is from Tom in New Jersey who asks, My partner's son-in-law calls himself a libertarian and a Trump supporter. She will have to deal with this guy at Thanksgiving. He's always right, never wrong, and becomes very argumentative and pompous. Please tell me what to do. Okay, I got a good one for this. Uh, I The best way to, to uh, dismantle the libertarian is to agree with them on practically everything because on many things, they're absolutely right. And I used to say libertarians, you know, like 50% of what they are for are fantastic and 50% are they're just, you know, batshit crazy. But, but don't say that. I would just say to the libertarian at the table, I can't tell you how much I love you and support you. And they're going to be right away disarmed. They will know what the hell's going on here because uh, they're so used to being trashed. And just go through the litany of things that they're right on. They don't support invading other countries, illegal wars, all this stuff. They don't believe we should be the policemen of the world. That's a libertarian position. That's a good position. Agree with them. Tell them thank you for that. Uh, they don't believe the government has any say over what a woman wants to do with her reproductive organs. That is just verboten with the libertarians. Thank them for that. That is, that is exactly the way it should be. And then they'll say, they'll add their great line, their great line. No government in our bedroom. Keep the government out of our bedrooms. Yes, of course. And say to them, and no wiretapping and no, all this reading my emails. Right. And they'll go, right. You know, you can marry the person you're in love with. The libertarian will go, absolutely. Does not matter what the gender is. So this will sound almost like a love fest at the table. People will start digesting their food properly. Uh, the argument with grandpa is is over. He's still trying to figure out what what, what the BLM thing has to do with the LGBTQ. And, um, you know, and you're now getting, you're loving, your, your sister has brought her libertarian boyfriend uh, to the dinner, and she's so happy that everybody loves him um, until, Basil, what is it? What the, where does the libertarian... All of a sudden, they've got the room, and then the wheels go off the train. Well, they don't want to pay taxes. They don't want. Yes. To, uh, pay, they don't, I don't want to pay taxes. What? <laughs> well, nobody wants to pay taxes, but come on. You know? What about the streets? What about the roads? You, how are you going to get home tonight? And then the, the, the smarter libertarians will go, well, no, of course. There are some things government has to do. Government has to do the roads and the streets has to do the streetlights. Otherwise, we'd be running into each other. And the, the government, of course, we need a defense. There does have to be defense. There has to be police. Uh, there has to be water and sewage. Like the basics, right? That's what they'll say. But not all this other stuff. And what's all the other, what is the other stuff that they, that they are like, they do not want their hard-earned money going to any of this other stuff? Well, I, I like how you started this. It, 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 it it goes back to what you said earlier about, and this is especially true of the libertarians. We can find a lot of common ground here. Yes, like we can really say 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 to them, "You're not just a libertarian. You're a libertarian with a heart." Mm. And they like they'll like that. You know, you're not gonna you're not gonna punch down on people, are you? You can go to aclu.org with them and oh, both yeah. sign up for your car to, to become car carrying members of the American Civil Liberties Union together. That'll be a great Thanksgiving victory right there to, to sign up a new member of the ACLU. And then, and then ask sort of the, the esoteric question of, so why is it more people don't vote libertarian? And then, and then pause for a second. He's going to not want to say it. And then, but you say it for him. It's because you want to get rid of food stamps. You don't want food for the poor or the hungry. You don't want, you don't want your tax dollars going to all that stuff, do you? <laughs> 
Somebody's got to say, well, yeah, we're not the, the nanny state. We shouldn't be having to feed people. People can feed themselves. And the more he'll go down that road, the more people will go, oh, I like that early stuff, what he was saying. But uh, Yeah. With conservatives, it may be tougher. But with people who call themselves libertarians, the more you can state your beliefs, your positions that are just common sense, and the more you get them to say, yeah, I, I agree with that then the better off you are and the better off the table is um, to just state these points of, of common ground that right. we have. But we don't want young people going and signing up for the Libertarian uh, Party. <laughs> no, we, we want them signing up for the ACLU. Get, get right. everyone to sign up for the ACLU at the table. Right. There's one thing we can all agree on, right? No government in the bedroom. Come on, folks. Yeah, yeah. And, and also Libertarians are against mass incarceration now, too. So... And, and yeah. think about all the post-9-11 government spying, government surveillance, uh, legal searches and seizures, just abuses of the – yeah, mass incarceration and all abuses within the criminal justice system, they should be on board with us. So there's a lot of uh, a common ground to have there. What's our next letter here? So this next question is – from Marie Claude. She says, hi, I'm Canadian from Quebec. I've been in the U.S. for over 20 years and became American to vote for the first female president. How quaint in hindsight. My question is, what do I answer my family and friends from back home when they ask, why are you still there? We live in Oakland, California. So, uh, so that's my yeah. question too. Well, well she left her she left her, <laughs> her phone number here so we can we can actually dial her up oh. and see if, if we can... Uh, if we can, do we do, can we do it? We have time. Let's we can try. Do this, right? Well, technically, can we do uh, it? Yeah, yeah, that shouldn't be too hard. Let's let me just dial right. her and, and see if she happens to pick up. Oh my god! Hello. Hey, uh, Marie. Uh, it's Michael Moore. Uh, I got I got your letter, and uh, I hope I haven't caught you at a, at a bad time here. Um, it's okay. uh, but, yeah, we're in a cab going to the airport. So, oh, oh, oh for Thanksgiving, right? Uh, complicated. We're Canadian. Our Thanksgiving is not in November. It's in October. Yeah. So we're actually just, we, we came here to Brooklyn. But we all know that the real Thanksgiving is in November, not October, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Thank you for going along with that and everything else you have to put up with uh, down here. Um, <laughs> But, uh, okay, but so let me just, I just thought, I just said to Basil that we should call you because that your your family is going to pose a, a, a good question to you, uh, which they have already posed to you in the past. Yeah. Considering everything that's been going on in the United States, certainly in the last five years. Yes. But I, I can take it back before that. But let's just say the last five years. Yeah. Let me ask you, why are you still here? Uh, it's complicated. So we've been here for over 20 years and, you know, sure. we've been through good times here and, and, um, we have three kids here. So the kids are, you know, we live in Oakland and they're kind of have their roots there. So it would be hard to leave. Um, and so we're, but we're all questioning, what are we doing here? There's some, some wonderful things in the U S there's, and, and then there's madness that is really hard to put those two together. And then I go back home and, and, you know, it's, it's, it is kind of what I want it to be. Um, you know, lacking the diversity that we have here. So it's complicated. Right. Right. No, I understand that. And, and, uh, uh so there's obviously a lot of things about the United States that you like. Yeah. Uh, well, maybe not a lot, but I love that in the U S in general, the space in front of you is open. There's no limit to what you can do. And mm. people, they are, most people are celebrating innovation. They're celebrating work. They're celebrating um, advancement. And it's a very open society in that regard. And so that's very enticing to stay because of that. Sure. Uh, why did you originally come here? Um, my husband got a job in New York. We lived in New York for five years and then, um, I followed him, had kids and I stopped working when we, when we became a family with kids. Is he, is he Canadian? Yeah. He's also Canadian from Montreal. Yes. 
Uh huh. Yeah. Right. So when others ask me this question that, that you've posed, yeah. what, what should I, what should I, what should I say to them? How do they answer their relatives, whether they're in Canada or yeah. the UK, uh, Africa, wherever they're at they're after what they've seen in other countries of us, Trump, even post Trump now, I mean, this crazy week we're in all the, these trials, racial violence, you know, what, what, what do I say? Uh, what kind of advice can I give people to, to give their families back home? So my take on it is, is a little, it might be different. We, we have three kids and two of our kids are African-American boys. Mm. And so what I do think and what I've discovered through living here for 20 years and learning about the heritage of the African-American community to be a better parent, you know, what I've learned is that pretty much everything in the U.S. is based on race and that the yeah. biggest backlash is whenever there's a tiny little amount of advancement. There has been advancement and we need to acknowledge that. Obama was elected. There is a better white uh, um, awareness of, of racial issues. And George Floyd is part of, you know, this is the first time we've seen so many white people waking up. There have been some advancement, but this country, my take on it, each time there's a little bit of advancement that could help Af the African-American community specifically, there's a big backlash. And the backlash mm -hmm. comes from like all different places. I mean, it, it's, and so there's a, there's, we go back a little bit. And my take on it is right now we're going back a little bit. This was too scary for too many people with too many money and power. And so they're reacting. So this is how I, I rationalize it. I don't know if it makes sense. No, I understand. And I think, you know, we're lucky to have uh, people from other countries like yourself and your husband here with us to, you know, every little bit helps in terms of just listening to you and, and your attitudes about this. Uh, you know, I often, I often say to people, I, I, I wish we were more Canadian like, um, <laughs> That that you know, and that doesn't it doesn't mean Canada doesn't have its own problems. Oh, totally. But, uh, totally. Well, it's really good here. I know you you you're in this cab and you're on the way to the airport. But uh, thank you for taking this call sure. because I just I wanted to hear. I wanted to ask the question your relatives ask you: Why <laughs> the hell are you here? And uh, I thought that was beautifully put. And and but importantly, what you had to say in terms of. Uh, the work that's still in front of us. And yes. Thanks for, thanks for joining in in that work as as residents uh, of this uh, country. And and uh, and I guess you had your kids here, so now you do have Americans in the family. Yes, we do. So, <laughs> yes. Um, and we'll, we'll we'll keep on on staying positive and 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 trying to do whatever we can do to make things move forward, knowing there will be backlash every time. Right. Right. Thank you for that. Thanks for your your own personal courage for that. And uh, and, Thank you, and Michael, and, and, very sweet. No, no, no. Very. It's uh, thanks for taking this time, and uh, happy happy real Thanksgiving uh, here. <laughs> happy real Thanksgiving <laughs> to you too. Okay. All right. All right. Have thanks, Marie, and thanks to your husband. Okay. Bye. <laughs> bye. Bye. All right. So, okay. What do we have? What do we have uh, coming up? Well, give me so, uh, Maureen says. Hey, Mike, here's one I've struggled with from my nephew. Her nephew tells her, I'm not anti-vaccine. I'm just anti-mRNA vaccines, which you do know cause long-term damage to our immune systems. So Maureen's wondering, I don't know how to answer this in a clear, succinct, and non-argumentative way. Right. Other than saying, oh, Dr. <laughs> nephew, I didn't know that you've been to medical school. Or you're a scientist now, you know, where, 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 I'm just curious, which class did you learn this in at Alex Jones University? I mean, you don't know, you don't want to, you don't want to ridicule. Oh boy, oh boy. What is the thing to say here? Well, I mean, you're, you're, I mean, you've done a few episodes on this, including the episodes where you've gotten your shots. I mean, the, the interesting thing with, with, and this is true of me too, that skepticism for big pharma government and the media 
is, I mean, if, if anyone, if there's, if there's, is, yeah, and not only that, but, you should yeah, be skeptical. And, and if there's anyone who's, you know, famously skeptical of all of these entities, it's you. And you were skeptical of <laughs> this vaccine, right. uh, you know. Yeah, it was the, to me, I called it the yeah. Trump vaccine. I'm going to have, I'll have to study this before I, I'm not going to be a guinea pig in, in Trump's little, he's rushing this to get reelected. That's what I thought. But, you know, I didn't realize that once I did my research and I saw, well, they didn't just start working on this when COVID happened last year. They've been, they've been working on the coronavirus vaccine since SARS, the SARS epidemic in, in uh, 2003. So th- this isn't a new thing. This wasn't done fast. It's almost 20 years they've been working on this. Th- in, on this. Then I understood that, oh, they're not, putting, they're not putting coronavirus in me like they do when they give you your polio shot. There's a tiny speck of polio in there and there's a tiny speck of smallpox, I think, you know, measles, those things. That's the way they always used to do it. Use the actual disease to create the immune system within our bodies uh, against it. Uh, this uh, this couple, this, this woman, essentially the scientist who who started working on this a long time ago, couldn't get any support for it or whatever. She was saying that there's actually a way where we don't have to put a speck of the disease in our bodies to to create a vaccine. Uh, there's a way we can create essentially a mirror, and and the, and we can train the body. Uh, to recognize what they think is coronavirus and and fight against it. Uh, I didn't do that a very good job, but I'm not a doctor like your your nephew is. But I'm, I'm uh, you know, I mean, that's the way I've tried to explain it to people. Skepticism is good. We all should have been skeptical. I was not first in line for this. I was going to read as much as I could read and talk to doctors and scientists. And we had them on our, our podcast here. We had on the... Uh, Zeke Emanuel from the National Institute of Health. We um, had on Dr. Red Leonard here from Columbia University, uh, Dr. Hotez uh, from Houston, uh, uh, and then the Pulitzer Prize winning author, Lori Garrett. I mean, we've had a lot of people on this to discuss it. I've done my own private talking to doctors and scientists uh, because I wanted to know uh, really what the truth was. And um, and I wasn't going to go on just my own emotional reaction. Oh, Trump Trump's got a fast uh, vi- uh, vaccine here. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, isn't that the idea? Isn't that the dex- dictionary definition of being a liberal that you have an open mind? You want to learn. You want to see all sides. You want to you know, and then do what you think is right. But uh, you know, I would just say to, to the anti vaxxers at the table, I would just explain to them. I mean, in the town I live in, in, in Michigan, you know, 95% of the people now in the, in the uh, intensive care are people uh, w- who were not vaccinated. And they're in there with serious COVID. 98% of those who are dying now um, are people who were not vaccinated. It's pretty clear that you are putting yourself and your family at great risk if you don't get vaccinated. And if, and if this vaccine was a, a wrong-headed idea, uh, the sidewalks would be littered with the bodies of people who've gone and gotten their vaccine. And that is not what we know has happened. And so uh, the science is in on this and I got my shots and uh, I encourage others to do it. So I don't know what Basil, is there anything I can add here to help her at the table? Just from personal experience, the great sense of relief I felt after getting my second mm-hmm. shot mm-hmm. Um is such a was such a great feeling after a year of pandemic. Um, you know, there's fear of you know my arm might hurt, I might get sick for a day or two. Um, yes, that 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 may happen, and it's minor, and it's you know easy to get through. Um, but overall, the sense of relief that I feel of, of freedom that I felt. Um, and I know a lot of right. people have felt that too. So, and I think if you all tell your, if you tell the story that Basil just told about yourselves getting the shot at the table, tell the others. Come on, you know, we wouldn't. You're our family. We wouldn't be telling you to do this if we thought we were going to be. Yeah, in and they should see that. Hey, I haven't grown a third arm or, or, or horns, or or my skin hasn't turned green. It's like, listen, tens of millions of people are getting this, and as you said, the streets are not littered with bodies of. Um, 
vaccinated. Uh, sadly, they're, the hospitals are filled with people who are unvaccinated, and I, mm. I don't know which, which group. Right. There's no chip yeah. being put in us. It's right at that point, though, the, the the unvaccinated person at the table says, yeah, then what's Bill Gates doing here at our Thanksgiving? Everybody turns down to the end of the table, and there is fucking Bill Gates sitting there, and it's like, don't bother with me. Just pass the cranberry sauce. No, I have enough of that. Give me the stuffing. I said, what the fuck is Bill Gates doing here? Jeez. And then you look, and then all of a sudden, we all look at our arms, and, you know, there used to be that little... Uh, that little thing when you got your polio shot and you have an indent on your arm for the rest of your life. There's the face of Bill, Bill and Melinda Gates on your upper arm for the rest of your life. What are you going to do about that battle? When that this is, I hear this is what their divorce was, was over, over how they were depicted on these tattoos that we're all going to have. Yeah. Well, he didn't want her. He didn't want her on the tattoo. He only wanted himself. And like, wait a minute, I'm part of this. You know, I developed this foundation. I'm the one that's doing all this good for the world, trying to get rid of malaria and all that. And you are going to put my face on people's arms. This next question, it's not, it doesn't sound like it's dealing with, you know, conservatives or whatever. It's, uh, it's, hey, Mike, I want to ask you if you think we are honestly going to be able to save the planet from global warming, or is it gone too far? Because that will be our discussion at the Thanksgiving table. And that's from Robert Alvarado. Wow, that's okay. You know, again, you want to enjoy the dinner. This is a rough one because, look, the UN has already told us it's too late in the sense, not too late in terms of saving the planet or our species, but to stop uh, the, the, the amounts uh, per million of, of, uh, of carbon in the air, in the atmosphere. They warned us that we were going to get near the end very soon, and we did. And just a couple months ago, they told us that um, – now what we have to do is try and make it from getting any worse and trying to figure out what the mitigating factors are that we can, how do we survive it, I guess, basically, is the question. Not, not, not uh, you know, um, can we go back to being a better planet? It's how do we survive the planet we've created? That's, and that is a discussion that's worthy of having because, because the, again, the planet is not going to collapse next, next month. But there are things that we need to do to protect ourselves. The fires, the floods, the hurricanes, all this stuff, the oceans dying on us. We have to fix this. We have to get on top of this right now. Probably too late to get back the atmosphere that we had had for, you know, billions of years. Uh, That may be gone. Now, how do we live in a planet like this that we've helped to create? I think, I think, I think that's a worthy discussion to have. Is that going to bring things down? Or are people not going to get to the pies if we if we have this talk? When it comes to conserving the planet, conserving trees, conserving species, conserving our waterways, we should be able to find common ground with anyone and everyone who, who we're seated with at the table when it comes to just that part. Of, of, of what we're dealing with when it comes to the environment. So this, this could be another issue where we, where we find common ground. And as far as the, the, the climate projections and all that stuff, I mean, listen, we're, we're human beings and we are built to survive. We will do whatever it takes to survive. We have reflexes. We have reflexes that want us keep, to keep ourselves alive and unhurt. And as bad as things will get, and as much of a point of no return as we've gotten to, we will continue to adapt and do what we must to survive. And that must include, you know, taking care of our environment, weaning off of fossil fuels, um, taking care of, 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 of different species. So perhaps there are ways to talk about these things in ways that can unify people that, that don't share your politics. Yeah. Because I think everybody at the table will agree that we have to survive. So just make it about survival. How are we going to survive and how can we all as a family, family and friends, what can we do after Thanksgiving as our own little group from our own little environmental club, whatever, whatever it is, what can we do? Michael, neither you nor I are, vegan or vegetarians, but I think many in our audience are. So we would be remiss to say that 
if there were a vegan or vegetarian on this podcast with us, they would say step one at the Thanksgiving table is to have a vegan Thanksgiving, a vegan this, a vegan that. Um, so, yeah, we need to yeah. eat less meat. I've already started to. Haven't you started uh, to do that? Yes. Do you eat the same amount of beef that you ate uh, a decade no, ago? No, no. I mean, th- th- that's more for speaking of sur- that's for my personal survival, <laughs> not just for the planet's oh. survival. But, <laughs> but yes, yes, I, 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 I do. You are part of the planet, Basil. We yes, need you to survive. Yes. Fair, fair. So yes, I do. Uh, I do eat much less meat. Do we have voicemails? Uh, we do. Let's start with uh, with uh, this one. Hi, Michael. Um, this is Patricia. I have a daughter and a son-in-law that's very right-wing, and they believe the world is ending, and we're going to run out of food, and China's behind it all. And I don't plan on spending Thanksgiving Day with them this year, but I just don't know why this happened to my daughter or even my son-in-law. What can I do to pray to get through with her, to her, or can I? Thank you for any advice you may have. This just breaks my heart. I, I didn't raise my daughter to think like this. Hmm. Thank you. Wow. Okay. Man, I hear a lot of this, Basil. This is not uncommon. You know, whether it's sons and daughters talking about their parents, they can't believe how they did do nothing but watch Fox News and they've gone bonkers, or parents who cannot believe uh, their kids who were raised in the modern world and know the truth about these things, and yet have son- somehow gone to the dark side. Um, well, first of all, let me say to you, Patricia, that I'm I'm for very sorry that this has happened. I know how much you love them and how it breaks your heart. And I'm sorry they're not coming for Thanksgiving, because even though it's maybe annoying for us to listen to the people that you know see the world in a different way, it's uh, we don't want you don't want to lose touch with them. You don't want to shut the door. You want that door open because, you know, as I said at the beginning, just as much as they switch to over to these crazy beliefs, it means that they can switch back. They're switchable. And you and I can play a role in that, you know. And and, and there will come a day, perhaps, where they will just say, this is nuts. You know what we believe in? It's nuts. It's absolutely not. Why do, how did we fall for this? We need to call mom and tell her she, she was right. And we're sorry. You want to be there for that day. Don't, I would say, not shut the door. But um, uh, love love is always a path. Love them up. Love them, care for them, take care of them, be there for them. Um, they'll remember that when that day comes, when they realize, holy shit, we've got we've to get our act together here because uh, the country is, the democracy is dying, the planet's dying. We need to do this. That's powerful, Michael. That's 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 great. That's great advice. There's there's nothing really to add to that except I, I hope that as as sad as Patricia may feel for her family members, I hope she doesn't feel like a failure herself because there are very very oh, very yeah. very powerful forces out there that have. That are at work, that, that are on, at the, work. on their sons and daughters' brains. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. It's not, you know, you could be the greatest, most thoughtful parent in the world, and um, these these forces will, will still get to children, get to other human beings. It's, it's just the way it is. So um, as, as much as it hurts to, to see a family member maybe go astray, um, you shouldn't you shouldn't beat yourself up over it individually um you should just keep right. as, as michael says you know just keep keep extending that hand and and um and be there for them and you know you can look at kids and you know everybody becomes their own person and you can't beat their you can't beat yourself up i'm just saying that parents you know you, you just you, you it doesn't do any good to beat yourself up and, uh, and and don't don't blame yourself for this. Um, more than likely, you were great parents, and they have a great chance of coming back if you stay great parents. We got another voicemail here. 
Hey, Michael. This is William Ramirez. I'm a young gay progressive uh, that's a part of a pretty conservative religious family. Um, and I'm wondering if you have any tips or um, any way I could carefully articulate my worldview to them as they don't often see eye to eye with uh, my thoughts and views on our ever-changing world. Um, I appreciate it. Thanks. Bye. Mm, wow. Um, well, Will, what I would say to you, first of all, is it sounds like you've, uh, there's a disagreement. They don't agree with you. So that you, you sounds like you may have come out of the closet at some point in the past uh, to your conservative um, parents. Let me just say for that, I thank you for that courage. This is what has turned, I think, the country around so many LGBTQ uh, people, especially young people, um, have come out to their family, to their friends, to their neighbors, to their classmates, co-workers. And it has done more to reduce the bigotry and discrimination uh, against uh, uh, our gay population uh, because, because you've been willing to say, well, I'm gay too, or I'm lesbian too, or I'm queer. You know, the fact that you've done that because what they're immediately thinking is, well, wait a minute, but I love you. <laughs> well, you're a great, you're a great neighbor. You're like the best neighbor we've ever had. What are they going to do with that then? Start to hate you? No, mm -mm. most will not. Most will not. This is why the all the poll numbers changed over a decade from this anti-gay, homophobic, no, they can't marry each other attitude to where the majority of the country believes that same-sex marriage is the, is the absolute uh, right thing to do for those who are in love with people. You are who you are, and you are to be loved for that. And I admire so many people that were willing to take that risk and tell people who they are. It's, it's helped us all. Larry Gibson asks, uh, Hey, Mike, how would you handle this opinion? We spent 50 years defeating communism. Now progressives want to bring it to America. There will be people at the table that will call Biden a socialist, a communist. Uh, you know, he, he wants to give away all these things. What, just say to them, what does he want to give away? He thinks Medicare, the, the, this is the health plan that's supposed to help old people, but it doesn't help them with their eyesight. It doesn't help them with their hearing, and it doesn't help them with their teeth. What three things go wrong for you <laughs> as you get older? It's your eyesight, your hearing, and your teeth, and our own medical system for old people, Medicare, doesn't help them with that. Ask everybody at the table, does anybody have a problem with the elderly, including the elderly at this table? Does anybody have a problem with them being able to hear? Should they be able to get a hearing aid if they need one? Does anybody have a problem with the old people here at the table just wanting to see? That's all they're asking us. Can I see what's going on? Is that okay, please? Is there something wrong that we can't pay for their glasses, their eye exam? This is nuts. Or uh, <laughs> poor, poor great-grandpa's down at the end of the table trying to chew his food. Half his teeth aren't there because Medicare doesn't pay for the dentist. So Biden wants to do that? What a socialist. No, not he's not a so Grandpa, grandpa, can you hear me? Oh, shit. Yeah, of course. He doesn't even have a hearing aid. Grandpa, wave your arms so he can see you. No, he can't see you. I'm waving. Okay, wave both arms. Okay, Grandpa! Grandpa! How's it going chewing the turkey? <laughs> then he becomes a food critic and says that your mom's turkey's too tough. You need it to be moister. You know, because his teeth don't work. Come on. I think there's a way to bring up some of these subjects with people who, even though they are not say on your side of the fence on things, they're they're going to support some very basic things that we should all get behind that are in this this uh, Biden bill that hasn't been passed yet by the by the Senate. It's been passed by the House. Let's get our elderly people this. Let's what is there something wrong with pre K? Anybody got a problem with that really? No. Why not? Yeah, because the rest of the industrialized world has it. It's a reason we can't have our kids get a head start get a leg up why do they have to fall behind and then be behind the whole time in elementary school because they didn't get that pre-k come on we we all support this 
This is not communism. We're crying out loud. Come on. Well, I really appreciate all these um, uh, these uh, emails and uh, voicemails that uh, all of you have sent. I can see there's a lot more to go here about what to do with a conspiracy theorist at the, t- <laughs> at the table. But I think overall, just to repeat what I've said here uh, today, they're not the enemy. They're your family. They're your friends. Yes, they've some of them have gone cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, but it doesn't mean they can't come back. They're, they're human. Maybe we haven't done as good of a job as Fox News has done. Uh, maybe, maybe facts have a harder time getting through than things that are made up, things that are a fantasy. Maybe that does win the day sometimes. So we need to think, what, what could we do to communicate better? So let's keep our arms open. Let's keep our hearts open. Let's not have the big uh, blustery argument with them. Let's let the kids at the table see us as quiet, loving, decent, open people. That will do more to make this country, this planet, a better place if our kids, especially at an impressionable age, grow up to be like us, to be open and to be kind and to understand that facts mean something. Science means something. And the democracy that we barely have desperately means something. That's the best way to celebrate this Thanksgiving, I think. It's the best way to make it up to the native peoples that fed us that first meal, (laughs) felt sorry for us, dying, shivering in the winter, diseased, Indians caught the disease. They died. You know, we can make it up to them. We're sorry this lamb was taken from you. We're sorry of the genocide that took place. We're sorry for the black human beings that were kidnapped and brought to this country in chains to build the country for white people. Sorry about all that. And, And here's a few ways we can try to make it up to you. We can be more decent. We can fight for equality. We can stop injustice. We can speak out every time we have the chance to do that. So to those of you um, who are on your way to Thanksgiving dinner, uh, we're going tomorrow, or you maybe had it yesterday. We're lucky to have the people we have in our lives. An outstretched hand is never a bad thing. So be well, everyone. Be good to yourselves. Be good to others. Uh, Have some great turkey and stuffing. Um, I'll try to do the same. We'll come back on the other side of this uh, next week. Um, I'll have a couple other sub stacks that I'll put up on my site. Please sign up, michaelmoore.com. It's free. Just hit the free button. And um, um, together, we could do this. There's hundreds of thousands of you who listen to this podcast, who read my sub stack. As I said last week, we just passed our 30 millionth download of Rumble with Michael Moore. That's that's friggin' amazing. And I won't let you down. I'll do my part. You do your part. We all do this together. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. And I'll see you soon here on Rumble with Michael Moore. Be well.